Well, thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be anywhere where people really take the arts of narrative uh, seriously. And I thank you all for braving the tornado warning to come out tonight. If the tornado does strike, somehow I feel we'll be safe inside this building. Um, I am wired up here, but this is for posterity and not for this room. So if any of you in the back can't hear me, either wave your arms or come down <coughs> to the front row. Um, half a century ago, the novelist and physicist uh, C.P. Snow wrote about the way these days we live in two cultures where scientists and humanists seem to have lost the ability to talk to each other. I think today we live in a different kind of world of two cultures um, that has to do with uh, whether you are addressing, principally by writing, either your fellow specialists or a wider audience. And there's almost an assumption that writing uh, is either academically rigorous and directed at fellow specialists, or it's unrigorous and it's developed uh, and it's directed at a wider audience. And I encounter this assumption in all kinds of strange ways. Uh, a number of times, I've received uh, letters or emails uh, from people who've liked a book that I've written. Uh, and have written me to say uh, how much I enjoyed your novel. And I always have a bristling reaction because even though I wish I were capable of being a novelist, I'm not. And I immediately want to write back and say, wait a minute, you know, that book had 850 footnotes. Didn't you count them? I wasn't making anything up, making anything up. But I think people assume that if they find something readable or lively, that uh, it's likely to be a piece of fiction. Similarly, I think there is sometimes an assumption among scholars that your work will not be taken seriously uh, if it sounds too accessible. And I'll give you a, a, a curious example of that. You remember years ago, there was the famous Masters and Johnson study of human sexuality. And I remember in an interview that uh, Masters did, uh, Masters and Johnson did, they said that they had deliberately written their first book, Human Sexual Response, in a cumbersome style so that it would be taken seriously by health professionals. I looked it up the other day. I never actually read the book. I looked it up the other day and just copied down a couple of sentences. And boy, is it cumbersome. Let me just read them to you. And you wouldn't think people could write about sexuality this way, but they do. In brief, the division of the human male's or female's cycle of sexual response into four specific phases admittedly is inadequate for evaluation of finite psychogenic aspects of elevated sexual tensions. However, the establishment of this purely arbitrary design provides anatomic structuring and assures inclusion and correct placement of specifics and physiologic response within the sequential continuum of human response to effective sexual stimulation. If you know what that means, you're better than I am. Um, they also wanted their work, their findings, to reach a larger audience, so they specifically hired somebody and cooperated with somebody to write a popularization of these books. Um, ridiculous to me. Why can't you write the same book for both audiences? Now, of course, we didn't always have two cultures of writing this way. Somebody who also had a good deal to say about human sexuality, Sigmund Freud, wrote in quite a beautiful way that was accessible to people far more than specialists in the field. Um, historians of an earlier time like Francis Parkman or Henry Adams expected their work to be read by the general public. When Thomas Babington Macaulay wrote his History of England, he said he would only be satisfied if it displaced uh, the latest novel from women's bedside tables. 
So how did these two different cultures of writing come into being? Uh, I think most of it probably has to do with the rise of universities and of specialized departments within those universities. Now, there's of course a vast amount of good that happened with all of this. Knowledge got advanced. Uh, there was certainly a greater uh, rigor and higher standards in research in many fields. But I think aspects of the way all this happened uh, have exacerbated this divide between two cultures of discourse, two cultures of writing. First of all, when you look at how universities operate, there's always the question of what gets rewarded in the academic world? What gets you tenure? What gets you the promotion? Well, it begins, of course, with writing a proper dissertation and then with scholarly publishing in your field after that. And almost always, in every academic field, the proper object of study is considered to be some something or some aspect of something that nobody has studied before. Now, that can be something good to do. On the other hand, why not study something that somebody has studied before, or written about before, but write it better. Take it to an audience that, that uh, didn't know about it before. Um, also, the kind of writing that, that is done and that is rewarded in the academic world is writing for peer-reviewed scholarly journals and for university presses. Again, I think there is a good side to this. I know that when I write history and I'm relying for some material on secondary sources, I tend to trust something that's uh, in an academic journal more than I would something that appears elsewhere because I know it's been through some very careful filtering process. And I also think that whether they're in the academic world or not, uh, all writers should and all good writers do get some sort of peer review on their work. They show what they do to other people in their field or outside their field and get their critique. That's all, all fine. But I think this type of writing also can produce, a, 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 can creates a pressure for a kind of writing that is studded or overstudded with references to other scholars. Because you never know who the reviewer is going to be that the university press is going to send your manuscript to. Or that the journal of ephemeral phenomena or whatever that you send your manuscript to, who are going to be the reviewers that they're going to send it to. So you put in references to everybody else who's written about anything having to do with what you're writing about. So you've got your bases covered there. Um, in the particular field in which I do most of my work, history, uh, there's another explanation that I came across recently for something that uh, may have exacerbated the, the divide there, advanced by the historian Peter Novick. And I don't know enough to know whether this is true, but it's an interesting thought. He says he believes that the divide between two types of writing in the field of history was very much exacerbated following the Second World War when the wealth of foundation grants available to historians meant that a, historian, a university historian who um, wanted to earn extra money on the side could apply for a grant as opposed to trying to earn that money by lecturing to the general public. Now, whether this is true or not, it would take a lot more research to make that case, but it struck me as an interesting notion. I do take encouragement, though, from the fact that there are many people who bridge that gap and do so very successfully, producing work that is both taken seriously by other scholars and that also is accessible to the general public. And I can think of, of, of many such people, some from the academic world, 
uh, the late Stephen Jay Gould, a very important paleontologist who also wrote widely and beautifully for the public. Uh, historians like Simon Shama or Jill Lepore or Joseph Ellis. Uh, a literary critic like James Wood. Uh, Jared Diamond, you know, professor of both geography and physiology at, at UCLA, whose book Guns, Germs, and Steel, of course, became a, uh, a bestseller for a long time. Then there are people who are from outside the academic world, but who I think are often respected within it. A particular heroine of mine, uh, the late Bar Barbara Tuckman, uh, other historians uh, such as uh, Hugh Thomas or Thomas Packenham uh, in England. And there are plenty of others one could name. So what does it take to bridge that gap? It doesn't require a peerage, although both Thomas Packenham and Hugh Thomas have them. It doesn't even require being British, although they and Shama and Wood uh, are British. I think it takes the desire to do both things, the desire to be both accurate and careful uh, and deep, if that's not too pretentious, in what you're trying to write, and to reach a wider audience. And to reach that wider audience, I think it's very important to think long and hard uh, about how to tell the story. Now, Paul Kramer suggested that I talk about some of my own experiences in trying to do this, in, in using storytelling techniques in writing history. Uh, and I'm going to do so. But I want to stress in advance that None of this is in any way whatever original with me. Most of it goes back thousands of years, back to the ancient Greeks, uh, where Greek playwrights were using these things. Aristotle was writing about them in, in his poetics. And I guess when I think about the principal storytelling techniques, I begin with the things that my high school English teacher told me to pay attention to when I read a novel. Setting, characters, and plot. Now these are absolutely vital storytelling techniques and they are much too important to leave to the novelists. Any of us who are interested in writing history or nonfiction, uh, uh, other kinds of work have to use them as well. Except we have to play by a different set of rules than the novelists do, which is that we're not allowed to make anything up. So, setting. I think an essential um, piece, an essential ingredient of any writing that is going to reach out and grab the reader's attention is doing things that evoke where these events take place, where the story that you're talking about uh, takes place, and that it's something worth spending a lot of time figuring out how to do. I'll give you an example uh, from my last book, uh, Bury the Chains, which was the story of the anti-slavery movement in Britain and the British Empire. There's a crucial meeting that takes place in that book, May 22nd, 1787, when the first interdenominational anti-slavery committee uh, came together and was formed in London. Uh, a real landmark moment in the history of human rights, I think. And it took place in a Quaker bookstore and printing shop in a little courtyard, which is still there today, uh, in London's financial district, although unfortunately the printing shop is not, called George Yard. And I was trying to evoke this moment, time and place, uh, and try to describe what the scene was like. We know what happened at the meeting because we have minutes of the meeting, but we don't have a description of the scene. However, there are building blocks that you can use to put together a scene like that. I could find out, for example, from scanning, I spent a lot of time scanning newspapers of the time, and I began to see advertisements for other businesses in George Yard. So I knew that there was a pub there, 
I knew there was a fellow who gave dancing and fencing lessons. Uh, these were some of the things that took place right in this little courtyard where the, the, the printing shop was. I did not have a description of this particular printing shop, but there was a vast amount of material on what 18th century British printing shops looked like, and also uh, a great many paintings and drawings, and I spent some time studying them. And that enabled me to construct a scene, and, and I said, you know, this is not a description of this particular place, but it's what a printing shop of this time and place would have looked like. And we know a lot of things about it. We know that the compositors would be working at slanted wooden tables with big trays on them with compartments, one little compartment for each letter of the alphabet, large and small. We know that it would have been lit by tallow candles and that the ceiling would have been blackened by this candle smoke over time. We know that in every printing shop there were a series of wooden racks overhead and a special tool, a sort of a long uh, pole with a clothespin like gizmo on the end, was used to take freshly printed sheets uh, of type that had many pages of a book on, printed on each side of them and lift them up and put them on these wooden racks so that the ink could dry. And that the, so the, these uh, the sheets of paper would be hanging down overhead. And we also know what a printing shop of the time smelled like. And we know that because the printers used a woolen pad at the end of a pole to clean the ink residue uh, off, the, uh, off the press each time before the page of type was disassembled. And the ink residue got onto the wooden pad, and the best thing for getting it off the woolen pad, because it had a very high ammonia content, was human urine. And so there would be buckets of this sitting around the edge of the room. So we know what the place smelled like. So from all these things, one can really assemble a picture sight, sound, smell, and I like to think that's something that carries the reader into the scene, the setting where the story took, took place. Um, whenever possible, when I'm writing history, I like to go to the place where a particular episode took place. Uh, I did a book some years ago about how Russians were coming to terms with the legacy of Stalinism. And uh, in terms of the actual reporting and research, I think it, it was the most fascinating project I've ever, ever worked on. Uh, a lot of it involved, of course, this vast gulag that was constructed under Stalin and then going around and interviewing people who'd been prisoners, people who'd been secret policemen, worked in the gulag and then talking to Russian historians, school teachers, other people today, uh, trying to figure out how they were coming ter to terms with this period. And I wanted to see what these old gulag camps had actually been like, to try to imagine what it was like to be a prisoner in one. Well, it turned out that although there were several hundred such camps uh, all over the old Soviet Union, any of them that were reachable by road from a town or city had long since been disassembled and stripped uh, for building materials. And there were only a few in a distant corner of the country, an area called Kolyma, which is right across the Bering Strait from Alaska, that were so remote that they couldn't be reached by road. So the only way you could get to them was by helicopter. So I was able to get a ride on a helicopter, a guy who normally made his living taking around bear hunters, and we went to some of these camps. And it was just extraordinary. You know, even 50, 60 years later, these old wooden watchtowers uh, still standing there, barbed wire now rusted surrounding them. The, those buildings which had been wood had primarily for the most part collapsed, but those that were made of stone were still there, and the one building that was certain to be made of stone in each such gulag camp 
was the internal prison within the prison where prisoners who were being, being punished for some infraction uh, were kept. And standing inside one of these places, its wooden roof long since gone, but iron bars cross-hatched uh, still on the cell windows, looking out through these cross-hatched iron bars at a landscape that looked like the other side of the moon, covered with snow even in June. It was an incredible experience. And I hope that evoking it uh, uh, through having been there helped carry the reader uh, into a little bit into the experience of what living through that time must have been. Um, Sometimes I think what you find when you, go to a, when you go to a place, the absence of something is what's crucial and what's interesting. For example, the book that Paul mentioned that I've just finished writing, it'll be out in May, about the First World War. Um, there's one episode I describe in it where I'm quoting an infantry officer, British infantry officer, actually Australian infantry officer, who was uh, in France with the infantry during the a couple of weeks into the Battle of the Somme. And he describes seeing what must have been one of the very, very last cavalry charges ever to take place in, in Western Europe. A small group of horsemen came uh, galloping up the slope, disappeared over the top of a ridge, and were never seen again, never came, never came back. And I thought, I'd like to see the place. I was spending a week traveling around the, up, the old front lines in France and Belgium. So I'd like to see the place where this happened. So I went to the spot. And what was fascinating to me was that there was barely any slope or ridge that you could see. The slant of the ground was just so gentle. There's no way you could call it a hill. And then it suddenly made me realize all of these descriptions, these eyewitness accounts of battles I'd been reading and what the landscape looked at, they were all written from the point of view of somebody who was either peering out of a trench or lying, if in no man's land, was lying flat on the ground trying to make as low a profile as possible. And of course, when your eyes are three inches from the ground, then anything looks like a hill. And even the slightest rise looks like a ridge. Um, so that was an important realization for me. Uh, related to the category of setting is the whole business of scenes or episodes. Uh, to what extent can you tell a story in scenes? I'm always looking for these when I write history. Uh, I like to be able to construct a scene, to find enough data to construct a scene, because I think that's the way to reach people. Movies unfold in scenes. You know, when you go to watch a feature film, you don't expect to see a narrator standing there for nine-tenths of the time telling you what's going to happen, and then a brief scene, and then more narrator. No, you expect the whole thing to be in scenes. Similarly, uh, when you read a novel, and of course, life itself unfolds in scenes, episode after episode, as we go through our days. Now, it's sometimes quite easy to construct a scene uh, historically. If several participants to a meeting or an episode or an encounter have left an account, an eyewitness account of what happened, that may give you enough data. If it was a public event, it may well have been covered by the press, and you can get several different accounts from journalists who were there. Uh, sometimes you can get a verbatim description of something that happened. That's why, you know, trials make such good subject matter for writing because you have, you know, if the transcriptionist was accurate, you have almost every word that everybody on both sides said. Uh, congressional or parliamentary debates, you've also got a word-for-word word -word account. Um, and I think those kinds of things are very precious because you've got back-and-forth dialogue in such occasions. 
from looking at the anti-slavery debates, the slavery, anti-slavery debates in the British Parliament, I think my favorite moment in one of those was when at one point in the House of Commons uh, they were arguing about a bill to ban the British slave trade and somebody from the pro-slavery forces uh, rose and said this would be a, a terrible thing because we've got uh, 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 tens of thousands of British sailors and all these people who work on, on slave ships uh, would be thrown out of work. Whereupon one of the abolitionists stood up and said, uh, <coughs> and also the, the man said, and the, and the ships would then have to rest idle in port and they would have no work either. Whereupon one of the abolitionists stood up and said, that's as if a highwayman said, I've got this stable of six horses here, and they are only suited for robbing gentlemen upon the highway and not for any other purpose. Uh, so uh, therefore, you should not make any laws against highway robbery. You know, those kinds of moments are, are precious because you've got that sort of back and forth dialogue. Now, Sometimes a problem I run to, into in constructing a scene, and I'm sure those of you here who've written history have, have experienced this same problem at times, is that you have rich data from which to construct a scene. Eyewitness accounts, um, you know, uh, accounts of what people said, dialogue and so forth, but the actual scene seems a little bit peripheral to what you're writing about. I see a few heads nodding. Um, I had a couple of such moments with this uh, anti-slavery book. One of them, for example, was in 1798, the Prime Minister of England, William Pitt the Younger, fought a duel, uh, pistols at 12 paces. Now, it's not every day that the Prime Minister fights a duel, and so there are a number of eyewitness accounts of this event. And it was very colorful. It was fought at Putney Heath outside London, which is a wild area. It was also an area where hangings took place. And as the duelists and their seconds and some friends went out to this area early in the morning, there was a corpse of a highwayman swinging in the breeze. It was also an area where um, uh, furtive lovers crept off to uh, uh, meet out of sight. and. Uh, some of these folks were disturbed behind some bushes by the people going for the dueling site. So you have all this detail. Furthermore, the people dueling, there was William Pitt, the prime minister, uh, who was extremely thin, thin as a rail. The member of parliament uh, whom he was dueling with, and this was over some alleged in insult, um, the nature of which was long forgotten, was a man named George Tierney, who was extremely plump. And so the joke of the day was that uh, an outline of Pitt should be drawn in on Tierney's body and only shots within it should count in this duel. Now, the duel had absolutely nothing to do with abolition and slavery, unfortunately, for my purposes. But it was too good a scene not to use. So, I looked for ways I could draw connections uh, from this to the story, and I found some. Uh, William Pitt had been strongly with the abolitionists, but at this point in time, he was weakening uh, in his support for the anti-slavery cause, and the duel actually uh, greatly hurt his personal, previously very close relationship with William Wilberforce, the anti-slavery leader in Parliament, because Wilberforce was an extremely pious man who was uh, deeply upset, not only that his friend William Fitt, Pitt had fought a duel, but that, he had, but that he had fought a duel on a Sunday. And <clears throat> so the two men's relationship became even more, more strained. And Pitt subsequently completely lost his his uh, fervor for the abolitionist cause. Can we say that the duel was a cause of that? Not really, but it was sort of a good moment to sort of take stock of his, the decline in his support for anti-slavery. Um, Turney, as it happened, the person he fought, 
uh, was a staunch abolitionist, as was his second, uh, General George Walpole, uh, who I was able to make into a character in my book and introduce him a little bit earlier. Uh, I had quite an interesting story. He had been a, a general, uh, army general in the British West Indies and was sent to suppress a rebellion of former slaves and ended up uh, so much respecting the people that he was fighting that he became something of a lobbyist for their cause in England. So knowing that he would appear in the duel scene, I introduced him earlier in the book and then was able to bring in a little bit more info information about him when we met him in this duel. Okay, the next key ingredient in that trio I mentioned at the beginning um, is characters. Now, telling history through a set of characters is by no means the only way to tell a story, but it's certainly a powerful one. And I find that what works for me is if I can find a network of characters who in one way or another are connected to each other and to try to evoke a period of history or a story of something such as the anti-slavery movement through a networked group of characters. I think that's a a powerful form of storytelling because <coughs> here again life itself unfolds this way. The life of each of us, e each of us is at the center of a web of different other people, many of whom have intricate connections with each other. And of course playwrights, novelists, screenwriters, you know, tell their stories in the same way. Uh, it's never, you know, a succession of characters who have no connection to each other that we meet in a movie or play or novel. It's a group of people who have connections to each other. They're members of the same family or they fall in or out of love or they're rivals or whatever. There's that web of connections that ties them together. So I always go looking for such characters for some way of finding a web of people through which I can tell a story. When I did my book, um, King Leopold's Ghost, which is about the uh, King Leopold II of Belgium and his conquest of the Congo and the system of forced labor that he imposed there and the extraordinary uh, opposition to this system which created a sort of international uh, human rights campaign in the early years of the 20th century, uh, I, oh, I really felt that a web of interconnected characters had almost been handed to me on a platter as soon as I began looking into this story. Um, there was King Leopold himself who was, um, you know, God's gift to a writer. He was a man who was uh, extremely uh, greedy, shrewd, brilliant, charming, devious, and just as evil in his personal life as in his political life. Uh, very important if you can find people like that. Then he had these uh, opponents, uh, Edmund Dean Morell, muckraking British journalist who you know, went after him for 10 years trying to expose what he was doing, uh, Roger Casement, Irishman, in the British Consular Service, wrote a, a, a very important report outlining how King Leopold's system works. George Washington Williams, a black American journalist who was the first person to blow the whistle on what Leopold was doing in the Congo. And then into the middle of the story comes sailing Joseph Conrad as a steamboat officer on the Congo River. You could not make up a bunch of characters who were as interesting as these real people. And you also couldn't have arranged the relationships between them, which were ideal for my purposes as a storyteller. Uh, Morell and Casement met each other many times, and each of them left a written record of the first time they met. Uh, Casement met King Leopold. Leopold sent somebody to try to bribe Morell to shut up. 
uh, Casement and Joseph Conrad were housemates in the Congo. George Washington Williams met King Leopold. Uh, he didn't meet Joseph Conrad in the Congo, but their ships crossed paths on the, their steamboats crossed paths on the Congo River, and we can figure out from steamboat schedules exactly what day, um, what day it was. Um, so I'm always looking for a web of characters like that. When I was constructing the book I've just finished on the, uh, the First World War, what I was trying to do there was to retell the story of this war, not in the conventional historical terms of uh, a fight between one side and the other, but rather in terms of a struggle between people who thought it was something noble and necessary and people who thought it was absolute madness and refused to fight. And for the longest time, I couldn't figure out, and I also I wanted to get examples of both this type of person into the book. The war resistors uh, and the generals and cabinet ministers and so forth who, who uh, orchestrated the fighting. For the longest time, I couldn't figure out how to get both these different types of characters into the book. Because, And I say, I don't like to do a sort of series of disconnected portraits of people. And then I suddenly got a clue. One day, I was reading a very boringly written scholarly article about a well-known British woman pacifist uh, named Charlotte Despard ardent opponent of the war, wrote a best-selling anti-war pamphlet, traveled the British Isles throughout the war speaking against it. Uh, before the war, uh, had been very active in the suffragette movement, had gone to jail four times, uh, ardent advocate of Irish independence. After the war, became a founder of the British radical, British Communist Party, involved in every radical cause of the day. And in one sentence in this article, the writer said, of course, her activities were deeply distressing to her brother. And it gave his name, Sir John French, which I recognized, commander in chief on the Western Front. So I thought, OK, this is going to be an interesting relationship. Uh, and of course, I immediately knew both these people were well known enough that there were biographies written of them, although. Interestingly, even though there are two biographies of Despard and at least four of French, none of the biographers were interested in this brother-sister relationship. Uh, Despard's biographers uh, you know, were feminists. French's biographers were military historians. I think each set were sort of a little bit embarrassed by the fact that their subject had, you know, a sibling who was of very different sort. They were not interested in their relationship at all. That's what interested me. And then I realized this would be the perfect way to tell the story of the war in the way that I wanted to tell it. And I began to look for other such divided families, families where there was you know, one brother at the front, one uh, in prison as a war resister, something like that. And so I found three families or family groups who sort of form the, the networks at the, the core of the story. And then there are some other people who uh, come into the story, and I bring them in only because they have a connection to one or another of these family groups. And again, I have that feeling that uh, I think one sometimes has when writing or reading history that this is more interesting, more colorful than any novelist could possibly invent. Uh, history just gives us these things, these people, uh, and it's for us to make use of them. One of my favorite characters, for example, is an Englishman named John S. Clark, who uh, grew up in the circus. And at the age of, actually he was Scots, not, not English. Uh, at the age of 17, he became the youngest uh, lion tamer in Great Britain. Worked in the circus for some years, then became involved in radical politics, uh, 
uh, ran guns to revolutionaries in Russia. Uh, during the war, he was uh, vigorously opposed to Britain taking part in the war. A friendly policeman tipped him off that he was about to be in, uh, arrested. He went underground, all the while publishing uh, an anti-war socialist newspaper throughout the duration of the war was being printed secretly. The police were never able to shut it down. Uh, <clears throat> finally uh, surfaced again when it was safe to come back up in 1920 or so. Uh, later went into, became a labor member of parliament, uh, ended his life spending a decade on the Glasgow City Council, and when he needed some extra money or got bored and there was a circus in town, he went back into the ring and was the oldest lion tamer in Great Britain. And you couldn't make someone up like this, or if you were a novelist and made somebody up like this, people wouldn't quite believe you. But this fellow was real, and I have a picture of him in the book with his arm around a tiger. Um, final ingredient uh, is that of plot. How do you unfold a story, and how do you unfold it in a way that is going to hold the reader's attention. And here, I think the essence is withholding of information. Keep people on the edge of their seats wondering what's going to, going to happen. You know, that line, meanwhile back at the ranch, comes of course from the you know, cliche image of the Western movie where something happens. You know, the stagecoach is robbed and the, the villain grabs the heroine out of the stagecoach and gallops off into the desert with her tied to his saddle or whatever. And then you leave the reader or the movie viewer uh, wondering and switch to another line of the action. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, something else is going on. And this is, of course, the oldest such technique there is switching back and forth between different strands of, of a plot. You know, every Shakespeare play does this. And I'm always looking for those meanwhile back at the ranch moments when I can leave the story hanging at a suspenseful point when people are, are wondering what's going to happen next. Um, telling the story of abolition of slavery in the British Empire was just ready-made for that kind of technique because it stretched out over 50 years time and there were many moments of either great discouragement by the abolitionists or of false hope or where something else made the action stop for a moment and I tried to make use of those a couple of examples. Um, and I made sure that when I stopped the action, I had another strand of the plot going somewhere else that I could turn to and, and, uh, and pick up. Uh, for example, one such moment where it was obvious to me I should sort of pause the action. You know, the parliament had much more power than the king by the late 18th century. But the king still had to sign all legislation before it became uh, law. And so if the king was indisposed <coughs> in any way, that meant you know, things sort of had to come to a stop because a, a law couldn't become finalized. Uh, and of course, God's gift to a writer again was King George III who went mad. And <clears throat> people went mad in much more colorful ways in the 18th century than they do now, I think. He believed he could look through a telescope from his palace and see Germany. He went out and shook hands with tree branches. He planted stake in the ground to see if it would grow into a herd of cattle, uh, all kinds of things. And of course, when the king went mad, it meant things had to come to a stop in Parliament because, you know, if they passed a law, he couldn't sign it. So, of course, I end a chapter with King George III going mad. That brings the action to a, st a stop. Switch to another strand of the action. Leave the reader waiting for a chapter or two and then come back and, ah, the king is restored to sanity. How, by the way, did they know he was restored to sanity? 
he sat up in bed one morning and sang Rule Britannia to his wife and daughters. And that was taken as a sign of returning sanity. Um, another moment that uh, I tried to make use of that way. The abolitionists were deeply discouraged in 1789. They had tried <coughs> and failed to get a bill abolishing the slave trade through the British Parliament. And the argument that was always made uh, against them was this one that, you know, if uh, Britain stopped the slave trade, then our great rival, France, would get all the business. And then suddenly, in you know, uh, July 1789, comes the news that there's a revolution in France, and the Bastille has fallen, and the king is out, and the abolitionist's friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, one of their great sympathizers, was now mayor of Paris, and all sorts of other friends of theirs were important, in important positions. So they felt enormous hope, and uh, they immediately dispatched their chief organizer, Thomas Clarkson, who's sort of the central figure in the book, to Paris. Now, as it turned out, that was a false hope, because <coughs> the French Revolution it soon became apparent, uh, did not extend to slaves. But I don't want to tell the reader that right away. I want the reader to feel that there's a moment of hope, but leave them in suspense and end a chapter with Clarkson going to Paris, turn to some other strand of the action, and then come back again you know, a chapter or two later. So I'm always looking for places where I can pause the action. Uh, in and, and, you know, often they are times when in actual life, as it was happening, there was a period of weeks and months when people didn't know what was going to happen. For example, in the, the book about World War I, uh, there is a moment uh, soon after Britain introduced conscription when <clears throat> they hadn't completely sorted out what they were going to do with people who refused to fight. There were 50 conscientious objectors, 49 conscientious objectors, who uh, were imprisoned in Britain and then uh, <clears throat> told that uh, it doesn't matter that you're saying you won't fight. You're being sent to the army in France where the penalty for disobedience is death and they were uh, <clears throat> put on a train in custody, uh, sent through London uh, to Southampton and put on a, on a, on a ship for Paris, for, for ship for, for France. As their train passed through London, one of them was able to toss a piece of paper out the window saying we're being sent to France against our will. And a sympathetic railway worker found it and immediately alerted the organization that was sort of the central organizing point for conscientious objectors. And they, of course, were frantic, uh, you know, contacted the, the war office, uh, uh, members of parliament, trying to find out what had happened to these people who, as far as they knew, were on their way to the front in France where they would be shot if they refused to obey orders. And nobody knew what their fate was going to be. Uh, then, a couple of weeks later, a smuggled message from France got through to England, and all, it all, all they were able to say was, we are being held in Boulogne. And the pacifists in London immediately dispatched two clergymen to Boulogne, and they sent a delegation to see the prime minister, saying, you must not shoot these people. But there were weeks when nobody knew whether these 49 conscientious objectors were going to be shot or not. And there again, I tried to use that as a suspense point to pause the action and <clears throat> you know, end a chapter or end a section of a chapter with their fate hanging in the balance and pick up another strand of the action which was very easy to do because it was right at that moment that the final preparations were being made for the Battle of the Somme, all of which was going on just a few miles from where these folks were, were being held. Uh, finally, 
<coughs> they were reprieved at the last moment and uh, sentenced to prison instead of death. But that piece of information I didn't want to give out right away. I'd like to have the reader on their seats, on the edge of their seats, wondering what's going to happen next. So these then are some of the basic storytelling techniques. And I think even people who don't think of themselves as knowing them or using them unconsciously do use them. I think we use these basic techniques, you know, trying to explain what a setting of something looked, trying to characterize somebody we met. We use it in conversation every day. We use it often very skillfully when we tell stories to small children because you know the only way you can get a child to pay attention to you when you're telling a story is if you can make the character really colorful, if you can make it suspenseful, if you can make them wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, and I'm just saying I think we have to apply them in writing as well and that you can do so in writing that meets the highest scholarly standards. Can you apply it in every type of historical or social science writing? Not necessarily, but you can do it in, in many, many, many kinds of writing. I'll just end by um, telling you a little story, which is this. Whenever I, I, I write something, especially when I do a book, I always like to send a draft of what I write to people who know much more about the subject than I do. And uh, since I write about history, there are whatever I choose to write about, and I tend to jump around in times and places to pick a subject, there are always people out there who know a whole lot more about the subject uh, than I do because they've been studying it all their lives. They're specialists on it. And I'm always afraid that they're going to resent an interloper coming into their field. But never is that the case. When, for example, I finished the Bury the Chains, the book on, on uh, British slavery and abolition, I sent the manuscript to, I, I asked half a dozen different people whose writing I knew, and in many cases had learned a lot from, uh, all but one of these folks in the academic world, uh, would they be willing to read my manuscript? And five of them, they all agreed to, and five of the six followed through and actually did so. What really moved me was this. Not only did they make enormously valuable uh, suggestions involving correcting factual errors uh, that I had made, uh, <coughs> and being caught in such things before the book was published was something I was hoping for when I sent it to them, but although none of these people were what I thought of as sort of popular narrative writers, several of them saw the spirit of what I was trying to do and made literary suggestions as well. One of them said, well, you make a lot of this character later on. Don't you think you should introduce him earlier? Uh, somebody else said, well, I think you could build things more suspensefully if you switched the order of chapters four and five. And he was right. And these were people who don't write this way themselves, but they were willing and eager to help somebody who was. And somehow that moved me and made me think that there's really a hidden storyteller in all of us and that those two cultures don't really need to be so separate after all. So why don't I stop right here? And if you've got comments or questions, or experiences to share in uh, storytelling, uh, fire away. Hmm? Would you like to just take that question? Sure. Yeah. So, and then you tell me when it's time to stop, okay? All right, so comments, questions, times when you've wrestled with this kind of thing in your own writing, I would be very curious to hear about. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I think my advice would be a sort of general piece of advice that I would have about this, which is study what the novelists do. Because um, I think, uh, you know, especially in the, in the 20th century, uh, and now we're in the 21st, there have been so many interesting departures in fiction writing from the usual sort of 19th century and earlier chronological sequence that we can learn a lot from the way that somebody like Faulkner hops around in time when he tells a story, for instance. Um, and I, I really think that, you know, when you're writing a, a book of history, often you can find analogies to how somebody has dealt with the same structural questions or whatever in writing, writing a novel. I think that would be the first kind of thing that I would look at. See how someone has, um, you know, used flashbacks and flash forwards in the novel or sometimes even in, in, in short fiction. Um, and uh, so I would say study fiction for that. And I do think that there are, if you do it right, there are just as many possibilities for building suspense without following strict chronology as there are following chronology. Because you, you're raising a different set of questions. Uh, and in a sense, almost any historian um, is telling a story where people know the basic story already. You know, uh, they know uh, who won the First World War. They know that the pacifists didn't prevail. I have to deal with that when I write about that, so the suspense has to be in how things unfolded. You know, they know that slavery was finally abolished, and so on. So you're not, you, you have already a different kind of suspense than a purely what's going to happen next suspense. You have the, the reader's curiosity is in, involved in how something is going to happen. Well, I think there may be ways of sometimes giving, you know, where you, you begin at the, the, the end, and then the, the story is a series of flashbacks that show how we got to that place. Um, I can't immediately think of a good example that would be the exact right thing to, to prove the point I'm trying to make, but I think you know what I mean, that you, know, you can use flashbacks and flash forwards. Many books, it seems to me, both Fiction and nonfiction often, you know, begin with a scene in the in the present tense or present day scene, and then go back to, you know, progression of events that show how we got there. But the more hopping around in time one can do in an interesting way, the better. As excellent example. Incid Ambrose Bierce's short story, The Incident at Owl Creek Bridge. What's that about? It's sort of a science fiction. It's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's an investigation of the idea of hopping between parallel universes. And it, start, it starts at, at the end with the character saying, I have been killed now. This is how we got there. Mm hmm. Okay. Oh, Eric Foner. I, I heard that. Yeah. And speaking of that, it's so often told that he's going to be this great figure that, that um, anti-slavery 
Mm-hmm. I think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, one tends not to be attracted to write about uninteresting uh, characters, but people can be interesting in so many different sorts of ways. So many different sorts of ways. Sometimes it's. Um, you know, a, a colorful thing like a fellow's a lion tamer. Uh, sometimes it's somebody who struggles with a moral dilemma in some, um, you know, deeply interesting or revealing way. Uh, the way that I got into writing Bury the Chains about the anti-slavery movement was this. I first started out thinking that I was going to do something entirely different, which was I was going to do a biography of John Newton. And John Newton, of course, was the great hymn writer who wrote Amazing Grace and hundreds of other hymns, some of which are still sung today. And uh, I knew, as one, you know, many people do, that Newton in his youth uh, had been a slave ship captain for some years. And I assumed that uh, this would be a fascinating story of moral trans transformation and that, of course, he must have written Amazing Grace and all these other hymns to atone for his horrible past as a slave ship captain. Well, the more I got into the story, the more I realized that this character I thought would be a paragon of moral transformation was nothing of the sort. He left the slave trade not for reasons of principle, but for medical reasons. He had an epileptic-like seizure and didn't want that to happen on shipboard. Um, then went into the clergy, became the most prominent evangelical preacher of his day. And while he was writing Amazing Grace and all these other hymns, still had all his savings invested with his former employer, who still had a fleet of sh slave ships at sea. And that relationship came to an end only when the ship owner went bankrupt and not before. And in 30 years in the pulpit, he never said a word against slavery uh, until suddenly this movement erupted uh, on all sides. And a man named Thomas Clarkson came to see him and said, Reverend Newton, you really have to say something. And then he did write a pamphlet. So then I wondered, who is this guy Clarkson? Well, he then turns out to be the central figure of the story. Um, and in a way, what I thought was going to be an inspiring story of moral transformation of one man turned out, as far as Newton's concerned, the interesting thing was non-transformation. Uh, he actually had his conversion to evangelical Christianity before he went into the slave trade. And he has accounts in his letters and diaries of meeting other slave ship captains and talking about this new evangelical movement in the church and how at one point they were, you know, they had trouble, he and another captain had trouble selling their cargoes of slaves in Barbados, but it was, didn't bother him because their ships were tied up to each other, next to each other and they could walk through the night on the decks of the ship, you know, talking about the evangelical movement. And I was, you know, you know, just bewildered. How could somebody do this, you know, when there were live, captive human beings chained below these very decks? And that then becomes the interesting thing in, in someone's story. So I think people become interesting in all kinds of different ways. Um, in Eichmann in Jerusalem, Hannah Arendt made a very ordinary man, Adolf Eichmann, extremely interesting in his very ordinariness and his, his banality. <laughs>
so what did you do? <laughs> I didn't write it. <laughs> I mean, I'm a great lover of fiction. Most of what I read is fiction. But uh, I do believe that there is uh, a line between fiction and fact, and that if you do get to the point of starting to make things up and invent dialogue and so forth, it should be you know, labeled as fiction and not as fact. Uh, and um, I, uh, you know, I'm, I just believe that, and I, I suspect most people do. I like to, I just think it's a sort of basic truth in labeling, and that uh, when you're presenting a book as nonfiction or history, it ought to be as true to the actual facts, the actual words that were spoken, uh, as you can make it. And uh, I certainly don't put words in people's mouths or thoughts in people's heads unless there's documentary evidence that they thought that or, or made it. And life is so interesting as it actually happens that you don't have to make anything up. Uh, and Nixon is such a weird, horrifying, multi-layered character. Why would you need to invent anything about him? You know, it's all there as it actually happens and is, again, one of those characters who is greater and darker than any novelist could invent, I think. I wonder if along those lines you'd be willing to comment on Edwin Walden's biography of Ronald Reagan, Chuck, the example being a historian who was defeated by the opacity of the subject, apparently, and thus in his case chose not to label fiction. And fascinating, we now have John Reagan's biography of his father, which is also troubling. I don't know. I think the, uh, the better thing to do would have been to try to do a, uh, a portrait of the opacity. And, you know, that is, if part of who Ronald Reagan was, was that he had a facade on that you couldn't really tell what was going behind it, what was going on behind it, that's part of the story, and it ought to be told. And to me, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, let him publish his book about Ronald Reagan, but, but label it as, a, as an autobiographical, as a biographical novel rather than as a biography. Uh, I just think, you know, there are, one ought to be able to tell the story as it actually, as it actually happened. If you can't tell a story that way, then maybe you should write a novel instead. I'm very old-fashioned on this score, I'm afraid. Gosh, I enjoy all kinds of things. Uh, I think I'm something of a traditionalist in that my favorite, favorite writers of all, I think, are the 19th century Russians, Tolstoy, Chekhov, Turgenev. Uh, there are modern writers I, I like, though. Um, I especially like people who I feel engage the political questions of their day. Uh, the South African no novelist Nadine Gordimer is one of my favorites, especially her short stories. Among contemporary American novelists, I think my favorite is probably E.L. Doctorow uh, for the same reason. Uh, I've been on an Ian McEwan kick recently. Um, and, oh, the list could go on. Uh, but uh, and in my next life, I would like to be such a novelist. But somehow, I've never been able to be so in this one. I have published one piece of fiction, though, which is a children's story. So, I think we're out of questions. Well, thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.